Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is Friday. We have made it through another week. And of course, I am joined by Tim Miller. Tim, how are you doing? How's New Orleans? Hey, Charlie. Uh, New Orleans is good. I'm here in my very makeshift office. The The computer is sitting on boxes. And I get to look at you when you're, with your fresh haircut. We're doing this YouTube style. What do you think? We, are, we you are, welcome? are you, yeah, are you are ready to make uh, it? It's like 2009, you know, we're, we're moving into the modern era slow, sure, slowly but surely. Our Fridays will be on TikTok soon enough. Well, I, I, I figured that we had, what we had to do was to have a little bit of a, a practice of seeing one another since we're going to be doing this thing in New York in a couple of weeks, May 18th. Smart. By the way, if you are in New York and you haven't, you know, you, you might want to see this podcast live, might want to see the next level folks live. Um, great opportunity. We have a few tickets left, but you have to go quickly. Wait. You we do. do. Come on. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. The weather's been great. The weather's been terrible everywhere. Come to New York, May 18th. I've got a, I've, yeah. I'm going to do a little TV. I'm going to do a little cable beforehand. We're going to hang out after. Select people might get invited to an after after party. Not I Charlie. Know. Yeah. Some of you. No. Be. Yeah. I, w- I won't be there. It'll, it'll just be the youngs. It'll be the, the people who will but actually the, be able to party in the, in the, in, in, in the, do they call it the big after party? After party. There'll be an where, after party. There'll be a little hangout. There'll be a little hangout after party. Okay. I'm talking about the hangout. after after party. No, I'll Champagne be. I'll, I will. I will definitely about. be in bed by then. Okay, so Tim, I was telling you right before we started. <laughs> um, I was making a list throughout the week of things I wanted to talk to you about, and I'm looking at the list today, and everything is old. I mean, everything <laughs> is like, okay, we just got to move on because the last 24 hours. I mean. I'm sorry, holy shit. There's been just so much coming down. We have the big sedition, um, sedition, uh, I'm sorry, seditious conspiracy convictions of the Proud Boys. We have new information uh, about the prosecutors uh, with a confidential informant or cooperating witness down in the Mar-a-Lago case. We have the E. Jean Carroll uh, case uh, wrapping up. Uh, I, I know I'm leaving things out, including... The latest gobsmacking story about Clarence Thomas and his wife, Ginny. So, I, were you a Wire fan, by the way? Did you, did you watch The Wire? Um, I, I, I belatedly, don't, I, don't I did COVID. I did The Wire during COVID. I, I caught okay. up to it. So, I, never, I didn't do it live. The, the amazing thing about the Clarence Thomas story, and we, we can double back on this, is, is this story about uh, Leonard Leo, the, the godfather of the Federalist Society, um, basically, you know, sending $25,000 to Ginny Thomas, but saying, don't mention her name. There's just, we don't, we don't want to have her name. And the thing that's amazing to me is they wrote it down. And so, so I, I had a tweet saying Stringer Bell would like a word. And that, that's kind of a deep dive because Stringer Bell is the character who's running the, the drug operation in Baltimore. And he notices after one of their meetings where they're planning their drug dealing operation that there's one earnest young man who is writing down notes. And he says, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm taking minutes of the meeting. And Stringer Bell, then, and I'm not going to use all the language, basically says, you do not take notes for a criminal conspiracy. <laughs> and this is the thing. They write it down. I continue to be amazed by that. Yeah, I think that there is a feeling of, um, you know, being being maybe above the law is overstated, but certainly a feeling of uh, the fact that they're in they rarefied touch air. Me. And that this is... The, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And a feeling of being untouchable. And, and a feeling of... Um, you know, getting comfortable with these sorts of deals. I, like, let's just, you know, step back. Like, like the Federalist mm-hmm. Society's little slush fund is 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 really immense, right? And there kind of are, like, it's two immense. Federalist Societies. Like, there there is yeah. what's happening on campuses on, at law schools mm-hmm. and, you yeah. know, rank-and-file lawyers who want to identify as conservatives. Mm-hmm. And then there's this Leonard Leo operation that's happening in D.C. that has all these nonprofit organizations that's paying lots of groups, that's moving money this way and that way, that's running ads right. and political campaigns. And a yeah. lot of that puts the dark and dark is, money. Is, yeah. yeah, and it's a lot. It's almost all dark money, right? And so... When you get into the habit, as somebody who used to work in the world of dark money, when you get into the habit of doing these sorts of things, like, you know, you, you start to get comfortable with it, right? It's like, oh, I'm not going to uh-huh. get, am I really going to get tagged over this 25 grand for Ginny yeah. Thomas? It seems like small ball when the amount of money that's yeah. moving through all of the various Leonard Leo operations is like upwards of nine figures. And you're getting into close to nine, you know, 80, yeah. 90 million, maybe more, right? So 25 grand of Jenny Thomas is like nothing, like this little payoff. Yeah. And so I think that is like how I get into the mind of how they get comfortable with things right. like this. But man, it, it, how really, fast really this is moving. 
Yeah, really yeah. comfortable. How fat? They're very on the private jets. Yeah. The Thomases are very comfortable. Yeah. Um, the uh, putting their feet up, you know, sitting by the fire with the weird statues of, you know, various Nazi leaders um, smoking mm-hmm. cigars. Um, the uh, uh, the thing though that's interesting Just is friends. this stuff is moving so fast. Right, like, like I was watching. I was suffering through Laura Ingram last night because our friend Tom Cotton is on. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah. and thank and, you for taking and they one didn't, for us. They 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 had the talking points down on the uh, on the grand nephew, I guess, that was also that his schooling right. was being paid by Harlan Crow. You talked about this yesterday. Great podcast yesterday about yeah. Ben Whittis yeah. and, and that crew. Um, yeah. And 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 he had his talking points on this down, and, and like he hadn't updated them for for the new Leonard Leo news, right? Like the amount of money that that is just you know the amount of different times that Ginny was in particular is getting paid. Yeah. Over decades, is 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 this is this is, a, this is a lot of money. I mean, you know, I, a couple of people have made this point. You know, it's the, it's, I know that the conservative media is working overtime to make you know this this into a nothing burger. But you know, Clarence Thomas is really making it hard. You know, particularly you know when you have this, the anti elitist movement has decided that yes, being you know flown around on private jets and taken off to exotic vacations. And then having massive transfers of cash that would be life changing for most normal Americans are just nothing. And I, I felt a twinge of sympathy, actually not, uh, you know, for the some of the NR bloggers who were all day, you know, working on, on trying to you know, polish this particular turd. And then what happens? We drop the story about Leonard Leo, you know, with with his grift with with Ginny and then saying, you know, but don't mention Ginny's name. And by the way, Kellyanne Conway is on all of this. See, this is the thing about dark money, Tim. If it's dark, the dark and dark money is you don't put it in writing. Hey, we are sending money to the wife of a Supreme Court justice. Don't tell anyone this. Click, 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 send. <laughs> right? Yeah. That kind of the- like, screws the whole dark thing. And this is the big contrast. So, so the big pushback on all this yesterday, and, and this was what Cotton was arguing on Fox. And so you saw a lot of the NR guys o- o- offering is like, oh, these leftists and the, you know, never Trumpers like are, are, you know, th- th- they, you know, are picking and choosing their spots here. They're bo- this isn't true. This is hypocritical because Sonia Sotomayor received three million from her book publisher. Right. And, and 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 yeah. she also and she rev- and she sat in. she didn't recuse herself for a case that that was particularly um, related to that that publisher. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm going like, they, are, are they even listening to themselves? Like they think this is the same thing. I get, it's fine. If you want to do a standalone critique and saying Sonia Sotomayor should have recused herself from this one case. Sure. Agree. Agree. But like. Getting paid for services rendered, <laughs> like, like you wrote a book, thing. the book publisher paid you. I didn't even speak to it. I, I, I had an editor at the book publisher. I got a form letter from the head of Harper Collins after I re- after I got in the New York yeah. Times bestseller list. It was like, thank you, Timothy N. Miller. Like, great work. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? It's not like it's like you have this personal relationship with the head of this conglomerate. Um, book publishing company. So like the whole comparison is 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 ridiculous and that's what they're that's what they're leaning in on. And of course and I, nobody I, knows what Ginny actually did for the money, right? I mean speaking of right. you know, money for services like what exactly was she doing? Nobody knows, right? Leonard Leo's quote even in the Washington Post about this yeah, is like, well Ginny is a well-known person who can weigh in on on matters of public opinion and public concerns for nonprofit oh. advocacy groups. It's just like this is just bullshit. Just, this is yeah, a do nothing yeah. job. She had a bunch of do nothing jobs because she's a dilettante, like for a bunch of conservative, at wor- you know, world groups. And like, OK, maybe if you're saying if, if everyone can see it, you know, then at least. All right. We're following the rules. But if you're doing it in secret, like this is not this is nothing. This yeah. is not comparable to the Sonia Sotomayor getting paid for writing a book. OK, like, there's no, not, I mean, there's it's, especially similar. when I mean, there, there's a certain consciousness that perhaps this is not does not look good. Right. If you write right. Keep Jenny's name out of this, don't mention. Look, I, I talked about this with Ben Wittes yesterday. This is actually an easy one to to analyze the the well, let's let's do turnabout. I mean, just for a second, imagine the reaction. Uh, on Fox News of the NR folks, if we found out that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was being flown around by George Soros, that George Soros was paying the tuition of, you know, one of her grandchildren or or grandnieces, if, um, you know, if any of these things, if George Soros was writing checks 
to Ruth Bader Ginsburg or anybody in her immediate family and saying, let's not let anybody know that we are paying family members of Ruth Bader. Uh, come on. They would be out of their minds. They, I mean, there would we would be having impeachment hearings right now. It's not a close call. I mean, is, is, is am I missing anything there? You know, no, there is no, um, there's really no defense. I, I, I went through yeah. and listened to all of, the, I suffered through all these conservatives' defenses. I almost got in a few fights on Twitter yesterday. Do you do this? You start to reply to people, and you're like, why am yeah, I doing no. this? Okay, nobody's do even that. on here anymore. This is right. my space. Okay, like yeah. people, are, you know, this is an empty mall. I don't need to fight with strangers on here. I, I the one thing, I, I do have like. There's something to be said for all of my, you know, uh, uh, for all of just my real anger. And I kind of despise, really, Ginny Thomas without having met her. And she was involved in an effort to overthrow our democracy. She seems like a pretty bad person. But, like, you know, the fact that they're trying to help this grand nephew, right? It's like a good... That's a nice thing. But, but yeah, it's a nice thing. And it's nice. And so, like, a lot of these conservatives are trying to lean on that. Like, these are good people. Right. And that is that is a nice thing. And it's a nice thing. Fine. If Harlan Crow wants to use his largesse to like, I'd rather him spend it on some gra- some grand nephews or education than on private jets. But like, you have if you dis- if you want to be on the Supreme Court, like part of the deal is you got to explain what's happening, right? Like that, that is the thing. And I think that you they uh, they felt like they were inoculated from all of this from a long time and, yeah, and yeah. were hiding a lot of slush money. And as you and Ben got into yesterday, in a in a different era, he would be yeah. pushed out. And well, I, I mean, maybe, it, it, who knows? Yeah. Maybe even if it was a Republican president, he might be pushed out, right? Like, well, I, you know, maybe if the in, politics in a different era, back in the 1960s, Abe Fortas, and uh, you know, I tweeted out that we all ought to study the history of Abe Fortas. Abe Fortas was, you know, a, a prominent liberal Supreme Court justice who uh, resigned um, because of you know some financial relationships with a with a millionaire that that pale in comparison to to all of this. So. Um, so speaking of Jenny Thomas and seditionists, uh, yesterday was a big day. Um, I, I do think that this Proud Boy conviction was the most important conviction so far. Turns out these guys um, are, are not uh, just casual tourists. Who knew um, that they are not patriots? They are seditionists. Um, they are traitors. I mean, this is one of those moments that we, you know, with all of the flood and all of the things that are going on. Take a deep breath and think about what just happened, that we have the Proud Boys, the, the folks that the president said stand back and stand by, who felt that they were doing Donald Trump's bidding, who were the tip of the spear and the attack on the Capitol. And they're not just charged with rioting or they're not just charged with, with vandalism. They are charged with seditious conspiracy. And they were convicted you know, up and down the lines. Merrick Garland had this to say yesterday. And now, after three trials, we have secured the convictions of leaders of both the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers for seditious conspiracy. Mm, Specifically, conspiring to oppose by force the lawful transfer of presidential Mm -hmm. power. Our work will continue. Mm. Okay. This, of course, raises the question that that curious minds want to know, what does that mean? Are they moving up? You know, how do you have a seditious conspiracy that does not include many of the principles here? So, you know, this is, I I asked, uh, I asked Roger Parloff of Lawfare to speculate, you know, what's Jack Smith's reaction to all of this? But this, this creates, I don't know, what do you think, Tim? I mean, how does this not put some wind at the back of Jack Smith saying, I really have to go up the ladder and I have to go hard. And I've proven that I can actually get a conviction for conspiracy charges, which means you don't actually have to be physically present and you don't have to explicitly say, go in and F up, you know, the, the, the Congress, you can have that unspoken understanding. So what do you think? I mean, at this point, it would become a huge, I think, failure of the justice department, not to continue doing what they've been doing. Um, agree. Uh, yeah. and it seems like Jack Smith is doing that. That's why I like having your Thursday yeah. podcast. So I don't yeah. have to be the, uh, to pretend to be a legal expert on this podcast. Yeah. It, it seems like things are really that direction. That is the natural question to those of us who are, 
you know, laymen out here going, right. if, if people can be convict, convicted for seditious conspiracy, who is more guilty of con- uh, uh, seditious conspiracy than Donald Trump? I don't think anyone. Or, you know, and you can go down the list of his other compatriots in that regard, Rudy and Sidney mm-hmm. Powell, et cetera. Um, so uh, Jeff Clark, for example, who I see is out there on Truth Social, sending out truth still. So uh, that Great. man is Wonderful. walking free for some reason, mm-hmm. despite his attempt to have a coup in the Department of Justice. So I, I would love to see his talking. move up. Yeah, yeah, and I think that the short term, though, it's important to just also just recognize how embedded these Proud Boys had been in in establishment Republican circles, right? Like this right. Enrique Tarrio, who's convicted. Like there are pictures of him with all of these folks, right? I mean, the selfies right. with uh, with Sarah Huckabee Sanders, and you know, he course. was in, going to a lot of the Trump Naturally. events. There, if you if you go to South Florida, a lot of these guys have taken over the local parties. The Miami Dade Republican Party, you know, mm. has a lot uh, has has Proud Boys involved. Uh, obviously, you. you discussed yesterday the stand back and stand by quote from the uh from the debate like like, so this is not you know i I think it's important to just to to recognize and to state and for democrats actually to make this argument and for you know the good five good natured republicans left to make this argument right that like this is this is an implication of the whole party and and certainly of the MAGA part of the party right like these were not like five dudes who randomly showed up to like create trouble because they saw an opening like these were political actors who had embedded who had had embedded as maybe a stretch but had like deeply connected themselves within the republican party infrastructure well and and also i mean just break down you know the the charges the severity of this because we're in the middle of you know an attempt on the one hand to you know revise it and it was no big deal it was peaceful tourists and then you have donald trump who is you know leading you know hand over heart you know, leading um, renditions of the January 6th prisoners, you know, God bless America. I mean, he he is now embracing this. He is trying to, you know, describe them as real heroes, as patriots. What happened yesterday was they not only convicted them of, you know, felonies, they convicted them very specifically of seditious conspiracy, people who betrayed their country. These are very hard cases to bring and hard cases to win. It goes back to the Civil War. And it basically says, look, this was not just an attack on an Arby's or an attack on a Starbucks. This was an attempt to overthrow the government. I mean, this is what's significant about this. And and I do think it's worthwhile. I, I have something for you here. here. Here's a montage the folks from okay. CNN put together early on where um, all of the generally Fox News talking heads are are saying, well, this, this January 6th thing can't be that big because nobody's being charged with sedition, are they? I mean, they understood this was a line. Let's, let's just play this uh, courtesy of CNN. Oh, it was an insurrection. So how many of the participants in that insurrection have been charged with insurrecting, with sedition, with treason? It's the Tucker. Five. Zero. So but you know what? No one has been charged with sedition. No one has been charged mm. with sedition or mm. insurrection. Well. We both have been hit Maybe with charges well. like yeah. parading. Parading. <laughs> Who knew that was a crime? Do you know how many people have been charged with inciting insurrection or sedition Charlie? or treason no. at, or domestic terrorism no, as a result of anything? Zero. Has anybody yes. been charged with sedition? Glenn nobody. Greenwald. Has anybody been charged with treason? Nobody. Okay. So why do they keep calling it an insurrection? How many times do words like insurrection, sedition, or treason appear in Biden's <laughs> own DOJ indictments against the January 6th rioters? Five. The answer, zero. Mm, These really. did not age well, Mr. Miller. I heard a but lot this of voices was, this there was the besides red line that Tucker. They drew. Hmm? I th- they fired Tucker. I heard a lot of voices in there uh, in that little Who's montage. It wasn't just yeah. Tucker over and over again, I noticed. It's across the network. Um yeah, no, it did, it didn't age well. And I I I um I spoke to a um or one of the reporters who was down in Waco for the Trump event there uh, yesterday. Oh, we were just kind of like talking through a couple yeah. of these issues and it was reminding me like who who was there in person. It was saying that like Trump you 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 pointed out that that he has lended his voice to the extent that yeah. he wants his voice to the uh, to the January 6th choir. But yeah, he's doing this on stage in Waco, having an event honoring the 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 people that are now convicted right. of attempting to overthrow the government. I mean, and I, who I, he has suggested that he will moment. pardon. I mean, now this becomes a yeah. major issue and he needs to be asked this over and over again. Will you pardon them? Right. So. Right. 
And and I think that it needs to be stated. It's just it feels so weird still, despite the fact that we've been living it to set for seven years. That it's like the leading candidate for the Republican Party is <laughs> in league with and promoting people that are literal traitors. I have been convicted yeah. of right. of conspiracy against the against the country and against the government and against the democracy. And and for and this is you know uh, you know we can I always. I'm just obsessed with the Republican primary stuff, so I always lead everything back to that. But this is like what's missing from that, right? It's all Asa Hutchinson is the only one out there like making that case against Trump. Not even in the uh, the more it'd be nice to hear some people making it in the moral case within the Republican well, Party, Chris but, but even in the practical case, Chris Christie mm-hmm. too. Chris Christie, yeah. right? But but even in the practical sense of like, do we really want to hitch our wagon to a, to a guy who is singing with the traitorous choir? I guess so. I guess I, yes, I, I guess so. You know, I was actually thinking about this. I mean, it, it's become now, you know, o- almost a cliche to say, what a gift to the Democrats, because, you know, it, r- rather than having to spend the next, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve 12 months, you know, debating the economy and everything, the Republicans have said, no, no, we're going to debate Donald Trump and everything that he says. And he's out there. He's out there promoting it. Now, I, th- I thought that montage was uh, was very effective by CNN. I yeah, just uh, I hope they play it at their town hall meeting their free live prime time town hall meeting that they're giving to the completely normal, usual presidential candidate. And I, I have to say that in terms of, of, of judgment, I, I don't know how you, you come down on this. I mean, CNN trying to explain and saying, okay, we do know he's unique. We, we do know that he's a chronic liar. We do know that he's an accused rapist. We do know that he has called for the termination of the Constitution. We do know that he is facing federal indictment. We do know all of these things. But nevertheless, proving that we've learned absolutely nothing in the last eight years, we are going to treat him like every other presidential candidate by giving him a town hall. What do you think, Tim? Can I offer a contrarian view on this? Yeah. I, 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 we'll see. This this might age as poorly as those Laura Ingram quotes. Um, so we'll see how things go Mark next week. Mark the tape here. I just... Yeah, mark mm-hmm. the tape. Um, I want to see it. I, there, there is a potential advantage. Okay, Donald Trump is is cloistered in a cocoon in Mar-a-Lago. It's it's he's in a cougar cocoon you know, where he's surrounded only by the people on the pool deck at Mar-a-Lago and the people that want to have Donald Trump themed weddings and the people in Steve Bannon's yeah. media universe. Like those are the only people okay. that he surrounds himself with. He doesn't get questions. He had that plane flight. There was a report this week. He had that plane flight to, w- to Waco. We had he had like two normal reporters on there, and he throws the phone of of Vaughn Hilliard. You know, at tosses it aside. He gets so mad that Vaughn asked him a couple of tough questions. He hasn't gotten tough questions for a long time, and so I just want to see it. I, I, I totally understand okay. the criticism. CNN deserved it. The way CNN handled things in 2016 was wrong, yeah. but it, it's a new leadership there. Let's. I want to see the town hall. See, the, the I, the, problem, there, the, there are a lot yeah. of tough questions that could be asked. Of okay, oh, oh, okay, there are a lot of tough questions that, that could that could be asked. And by the way, I, guess I have something else for you here. Now I can't play the whole thing because it runs more than five minutes. But <laughs> Mehdi Hassan, okay. who is, can we put it on two x speed? <laughs> we could. We maybe we should do that. So, I, look, <laughs> Mehdi Hassan. I, I, I'm sure I disagree with him on a lot of issues, but the man is, he's freaky good. He's he's a national treasure. And I don't know whether you saw his montage where he came up with, okay, CNN, I wouldn't do this, but since you are going to normalize this guy, you are going to give airtime to this guy. Here are 10 questions that you should ask him. And then he goes through the 10 questions. They are all outstanding. I think we have time for the first two. Give you a flavor. This is Mehdi Hassan. Personally, I wouldn't interview a man who has used live interviews to incite violence and tell lies who has in the past encouraged violence against CNN itself. I wouldn't normalize him in that way. But if you are going to interview him, you need to have some very tough and very specific questions. Here are 10 questions I would ask Donald Trump if I had to do an interview with him and that CNN should consider posing to the indicted former president next week. Number one, the president of the United States has to swear an oath to preserve, protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. You are on record, Mr. Trump, just a few months ago, calling for the termination of parts of the Constitution. So you have disqualified yourself from the presidency, have you not? Number two, 
Many would argue that you, Mr. Trump, disqualified yourself from the presidency on January the 6th, 2021, when you incited a mob to march on Congress and fight like hell. A mob you knew was armed, a mob you beckoned to Washington, D.C., a mob that included Proud Boys since convicted of sedition. And on the day itself, it wasn't just Fox mm. hosts like Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram who sent texts to your chief of staff That's demanding you condemn the violence, <laughs> but also your own son, Don Jr. So why didn't you? And why did your own son have to beg you to condemn the rioters? There you go. Okay, so and this goes on. And for a little bit, more. there was, was more of a comment than a question for a minute. Of course, there, yeah, but, yeah, um, but but I mean, the thing about it is... You could do a hundred of them. He did ten. The whole video is good. You could do a hundred. That's my point. So the the, the problem with the town hall, um, I mean, there's several problems with the town hall. Well, one is uh, the, the time limitation. And, you know, the Donald Trump can have a fire hose of lies. You will not be able to fact check every lie fast enough. Yeah. Uh, number two, he will go off on tangents. And he knows that, that if he filibusters, he will just chew up time that they cannot get back. Um, third, it's a town hall meeting, which means the 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 potential for really stupid questions um, is great. If if it was an hour of Mehdi Hassan or Jonathan Swan interviewing Donald Trump, that's one thing. But this kind of format, what could go wrong? I don't know. I have low expectations. Yeah. You you have this unicorn hope okay. that, that he's going to melt down and then he's going to get all sweaty and spits no. going to fly and he's going to throw the <laughs> microphone at Caitlin Collins, you know, and they say, damn right, no, I called the I'm code red. Yes, that- I wanted a coup. I want a coup again. We got to finish the coup. All, yeah, I'm, that's all I'm saying is that we're in a different world than in 2015. We're in a different world than 2015. The challenges no. of dealing with him are different. And, you know, are engaging. We? And, and the more Trump is talking about a lot of the shit, the worse he's done. And, and this is, again, this isn't. Now, he has actual things that he can be engaged upon. This is different than the empty podium. That's all I'm saying. It could end up being like the empty podium, but I think that we have to. He's the lead. He's the leading candidate in the Republican primary. What are we yeah. going to do? Ne- had never have any media people question him? No, I, no, I, no. Like, see, that's, I, no, that's, this is just that, the, that, this, these, the are, these are I bad options. Yeah. Yeah. No, you cover him. You have media people do it, but you treat it like you, you, you practice journalism as opposed to reality television. That's the distinction. Sure. You do not just give him unedited live time. You do cover him. You cover him extensively. I'm one of those who believes that, you know, you want to cover him every every time, you know, he says something, you know, do a story about it. I mean, I don't think ignoring him is a good idea. I think that we should expose him. On the other hand, these kinds of formats, I, I think, are designed for him. And plus, he can't lose because no matter how tough she is, um, no matter how awful he is, he's going to come out and he's declare that he's the winner and that he's the martyr, that he's both the champion and the victim. Right. Oh, see what they did to me on CNN. They beat me up. Uh, uh, that media. didn't work in 2020, though. Savannah Guthrie, Savannah Guthrie got him, <laughs> got the best of him. That didn't help him. It didn't help. him. I, I look, there is a whole different mm-hmm. ecosystem. Yeah. Things have changed. I, and it gets I get a little frustrated. When I hear the media criticism, I think there's plenty of, of legitimate media criticism, which I issue sometimes, but it, uh, mm. it's like, oh, we can't engage. We You shouldn't engage with the guy. You shouldn't. Th- that's fighting the last war. OK, he yeah. already became the president. Now yeah. he has to be held accountable. And he has this entire media ecosystem. I think that really pissed me off is the right wing media critics that are like, CNN is doing this again. They're back to the empty podium. I'm just like, I'd love to hear you guys criticize anyone in the right wing world. Like, like the, the people who are reading, who are voting for Donald Trump aren't watching CNN. Okay, like th- there's an entire yeah. ecosystem of news that they get. I just listen to when in every focus group on, on Sarah's podcast, she starts pe- and asks people, where do you get your information? Nobody's like, oh, I'm watching Don Lemon. Who's R.I.P. No, you know, yeah. nobody's like, oh, I get it from Anderson Cooper and Jake Tapper. I'm a I'm a religious viewer of Jake Tapper's show. No, so, oh, so I, I, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I understand that argument, but. I have to say that you say it's it's not 2015 anymore, and yet these feel like 2015 arguments again, that if we just show him and people will see that he's crazy, it will go away. Well, that did not happen. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it would, I, I wish uh, we would have had the, the kind of questioning from Mehdi Hassan. Okay, so since we're on the media criticism topic, um, okay, I'm going to get your, your, your take on the you whole- take uh, for me? T- yeah, I want to get your take. On the whole Tucker Carlson text thing, because I just want to lay it out here. I'm not buying this story. I'm not buying the story that, that uh, you know, the day before the trial, um, the Fox board was shocked 
and panicked and alarmed to find out that Tucker Carlson was a racist asshole. I was like, who knew this? I mean, and, and they decided that they had to do something because he had this text message where he describes how um, he was watching a group of Trump supporters jump on an Antifa protester. He wanted them to beat the shit out of him. He found himself, you know, this was not the way white men fight, but he found himself, you know, hoping that they would actually, you know, kill him. And then he thought, well, you know, I don't want to become that person. Okay, for two things. Number one, that text just confirms everything we knew about Tucker Carlson. We knew that it confirmed that he was in private what he was in in public. The fact that he was racist, not a, a surprise. They've known this for months. Why would that text message have triggered anything? I think there's kind of this, we're in the midst of, a, and I'm not defending or, or cutting him any slack whatsoever, but there is this Fox PR campaign out there that I think has two things. Number one, they want to you know make him look bad, which is fine. But they also kind of want to make him, you know, look, he was the bad actor. And maybe let's talk about Tucker Carlson rather than talk about the fact that we have just been exposed, um, you know, losing the biggest defamation suit in American history as a bunch of chronic liars. So what do you what do you think about the Tucker texts? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm not impressed by the Fox PR campaign on this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, to me, frankly, a lot of these leaks uh, have made. Fox look much worse than Tucker. I, I, again, mm -hmm. it's just me. I don't, it is what it is. Like Media Matters is pointing out, is putting, posting a lot of videos of him behind the scenes. And someone from Fox is leaking where he's like saying kind of sexist stuff. And it's like, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not, but none not of it's worse Tucker. than what he did night Tucker's after night after night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, why are you leaking this pri this video where he thinks he's in private, where like he, you know, makes a joke about like women, you know, wanting to see women pillow fight. Like, yeah, it's kind of gross, but like that's way less gross than what he was doing way. on TV in front of millions of people. Right. And so to me, this is just Fox, like trying to do some face saving, trying to make sure advertisers come back. And it's just and I'm, I, my response is kind of fuck you guys. And, I, you know, no, there's yeah. there was a, a Vox story um, that, that that quoted me on this because I, I basically gave this opinion on Twitter a couple of days ago. And um and they were saying that, oh, well, I was missing that, like, this text was, like, more directly racist than the stuff on TV because he specifically yeah. said white people are better than black people because they don't jump people. And I was and like, yeah, sure. OK, like maybe like, yeah. if we're slicing this really thin, like, it, 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 you know, he does he didn't do the, oh, you know, colorblind bullshit that he does on TV. What, when he's talking about thugs in the streets and talking about the gypsies coming for your family he, and all, all the other, you know, the replacement yeah. theory, uh, you know, Dirty so I just, to me, it's just like the TV's. Yeah, exactly. The TV stuff is what matters to me. And I think this is just Fox, you know, trying to save their ass. I'm not impressed. I'm interested, by the way, just really quick on the Tucker thing. One other take. Um, the ratings are down. Badly. And it's hurting the other hosts. Yeah, and 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 I think this was an open yeah. question. We discussed this on the next level podcast, but the day after, and it was like, well, it'll be interesting to see because you know O'Reilly left, and and everybody's like, oh wow, you know, is O'Reilly getting pushed out? It's gonna hurt. It didn't really hurt him in the end. Yeah. And, and I always felt like Tucker might have been a category difference. It's only been a week or two. Maybe you know you get back to election season, people. Yeah you know, get back to their back. habits. But yeah. Um, so, yeah, maybe. But uh, it's noteworthy, though, that like there's been a very substantial drop. And, and, and I don't again, back to the other point, I don't think those people are turning are turning the channel to Anderson Cooper. You know, they're turning the channel over to Greg Kelly and Eric Bowling and the yeah. freaks on Newsmax. You know, yeah, I, 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 I think that may be a temporary phenomenon um, because I think we've seen this maybe. so many times. And I mean, again, we, 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 we will find out. Um, but, you know, the thing about the, the Tucker text, I don't want to you know keep dwelling on all of this. But, you know, as I was reading this story and the and the spin from the Fox folks that they were this was really what what panicked them. Um, first of all, I don't get it because it didn't have anything to do with the Dominion lawsuit directly. I'm not even sure how it would have been introduced. It was redacted and all of this stuff. Um, right. But so he says some racist things, which did not tell us anything new. Because here's a guy that's been pushing the great replacement theory. I mean, you can do we could do a montage of all the racist things he's he said on on the air. So that's not new. The 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 overall context though is he's writing in a moment of introspection. And this was the kind of the surprising thing, which he's, he's saying, okay, I'm watching this thinking, 
I want them to beat the shit out of this guy. I want them to kill him. And then I thought, wait, no, no, no. I don't want to become that person. Um, I really, and it, it was one of the, it, I'm, I'm trying to think what an analogy would be. It would be like, you know, Jimmy Carter saying, you know, I have lust in my heart, but then I, that's a dated one, but, but no, I'm not, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to. I mean, there's a long history of people thinking I am tempted to do this and I pull back from it. I am not sure that text made him look as bad as we as as they tried to market it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, racist, racist. Yeah, like, I thought, like, I thought like, it was like really violence. Weird text. We knew we knew that. Actual conscience and yeah. introspection. Hmm. Yeah. Who's sending Did, these long essay style texts? I don't. It, it didn't doesn't read like a text. It's a very it's a very weird thing. Uh, I agree with you. I, again, yeah. within the introspection. He he doesn't he doesn't introspect about the line about how he thinks white people don't fight like this. He yeah, introspects I, about the effort of wanting to see the Antifa guy get beaten up. That said, I agree with you. I, I just uh, to me, I haven't seen anything. Nothing that's been leaked has made me think. Oh man, that is really worse than what is on TV. Like uh, to me, uh, if anything, it's made him look better than what was on TV, and and I think that it's all bullshit, yeah. post hoc rationalization from the suits. So you you know who we haven't mentioned so far in this podcast, which is amazing. We have not mentioned Ron DeSantis. Mm, I haven't Biden. mentioned Ron DeSantis mm, because it's well, well, we haven't mentioned Joe Biden either, which is that's we've been on that before. But I, the I, 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 I was thinking about it whether or not I was we were even going to talk about it because I feel it's been done so much, which is really kind of remarkable in itself. The guy has not even announced that he's running for president, and there's kind of this sense that it's already over, that it's blown up on the launch pad. So let, let's not talk about why that's happened because I think we all know. But yeah. here's, here's what the take I wanted to get from you was: yeah. Is it possible he won't run? I mean, given how bad the polls are, given how bad the buzz is, given the fact that no. people are like Nate Cohn's writing in the New York Times that, you know, that basically his campaign's over before it begins. Does he know that? M might he not get in? What do you think? No, I think he's going to run. Um, and this is my not my party is about this this week. And I, yeah. I, I out of character, um, give him a little advice at the end, like a little yeah. advice for Tiny D. That's just like maybe this is something you should consider um is uh is, is getting back to to the the type of positioning you had when you were doing well in the polls um crazy idea i know um which, which but, is what I, look, I mean i think that he is i mean obviously the, the trump attacks and the trump indictments have hurt him okay but the other yeah. thing that's hurt him is he's is that he doesn't feel electable anymore like right like the, the reason to move off trump onto him was that republican voters who liked trump were like trump can't win i'm gonna we're gonna try this guy because he's a winner ron doesn't seem like a winner right now in part because he had this insane legislative session where where, where he's like oh we're gonna do a six-week abortion ban trump's even criticizing it right and and republican voters get this they're like i don't know ooh, i don't know i might be for that and but i don't i'm a little worried about this guy then his performance he doesn't seem like a fighter anymore he doesn't seem like a tough guy he seems weird so he's gone from like being this tough guy that can win in a red state to being kind of a weird person with 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 uh uh extreme policy views that might seem less electable than trump I and mean, you looked at that wall street journal poll his electability advantage to trump versus trump had shrunk to 10 like 40 percent of republican right. voters thought ron was more electable 30 percent thought don 30 percent didn't know so like that you can't win he can't win if that's the number and he's got to really crush trump on the electability okay. uh, argument so anyway right. uh so to your question i think he gets in because he's the he still remains despite being weakened, the only one that could beat Trump. He has a very small circle, and his circle includes his wife, who obviously wants to be Jackie Kennedy, uh, and, you know, a bunch of uh, sycophants in Florida who think that he, who, yeah. uh, who think that he's kind of like godlike. You know, there were some weird Trumpian elements to a recent event that he had in Florida where people were like, DeSantis is the strong one on a horse. Okay, and donors and strategists who want money from him. You know, so these are the people that are talking to him, all people that all people that want him to run. Yeah. And I just and I think that if you if you back out now, he seems so weak and so emasculated. It ne you can never come back from it. Look, Scott See, Walker, I, Ted Cruz, right. none of those guys are running at this time. Right. Like like once you've been emasculated to that level by right. Trump, you can't run again. And so I think this I think he still will think this is his chance.
Okay, so I think that's a smart take because uh, I, I know there are people who are saying that, uh, okay, he's a young man. If he, if he doesn't run, if he doesn't go into this buzzsaw, he can, he can go in four years. He can, go, he can go in eight years. Well, you know, the way things are going, he can, go in, he can go in 40 years. But to your point, you cave in now and you have put loser weakling, you know, on yes. your forehead forever. Yes. Especially, when, especially yes. when your super PAC is don't back down. So, what about have you heard this yeah. buzz about draft Brian Kemp out of Georgia? Because I know there's been you know, been some buzz about. Wait, there's this other successful governor who won one re-election who has not you know gone full DeSantis or full or full Trump and actually stood up to Donald Trump. I mean, you know, strong MAGA cred except for not going along with stealing, you know, stopping the steal, et cetera. So, what do you think, Brian Kemp? Is that real? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think that in an imaginary universe that we do not live in, Brian Kemp is the obvious person to to run uh, in the Republican Party, uh, given the Emphasis problem in Georgia. Imaginary. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I think that the people that are pushing this uh, are are wish casting that the Republican Party is something that it isn't. No, so I, I, so. I would love to see it as a political science exercise. Um, I think that obviously the country would be much better off with Brian Kemp as a Republican nominee yeah. than, than somebody that that helped try to overthrow our democracy or or tried to overthrow our democracy in Donald Trump's case. Um, even if I disagree with Brian Kemp on certain issues, uh, that's true about Joe Biden for that matter. Um, yeah. So I, like I, I would like to see that, um, but I think that it's wish casting. And, um, you know, that's what I got into with Karl Rove when we were, when we were on that panel a, a couple months ago. I, I was like, look, if voters wanted what yeah. Karl Rove is saying that they want, right, which is mm -hmm. traditional Republican values, blah, 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 then, then there would be a groundswell for Brian Kemp because that's what he offers yeah. is traditional Republican yeah. values, a, ability to win. That's not what they want. There is no ground. The only groundswell for Brian Kemp is in – you know, pundit circles of of before times pre Trump Republicans. Sarah Longlaw had that great article for the book a week ago. If you haven't read it, go find it. That said, um, you know, anything like Trump is year zero. Anything before, you know, the Republican voters don't want anything from BT. You know, before Trump, they want new, and the people that are doing the Kemp pitch are all BT Republican strategist elites who are wish casting. I, I would I would love nothing more to be wrong about this. But I'm about ninety nine point. I know. I, I, I don't think. Right. I don't think you are wrong um, uh, about this. Okay, so this is not actually on my list of things I wanted to talk to you about. But as we were talking about wish casting, you made a long list of things, of things that you. Cut. I made a long list of things that I wanted to talk about that I'm not going to get to. I, I'm, I'm unfortunately including all the show <laughs> tunes I was going to play for you. But but no. So did you see that um, that long um, transcript of a conversation of? the um, no labels people who are the, this no labels yeah. group, which is apparently seriously thinking of raising tens of millions of dollars to put some third party on the ballot. Maybe it's Joe Manchin or everything. And despite the fact that most people are looking at them and going, you want to talk about wish casting. I mean, the only role you will play is spoilers. Um, I I mean, how dangerous are they? And And, and, and I say this because there will be people who will look at what the no labels people are saying and thinking, hey, that sounds like you bulwark people, right? I mean, you know, you're not tribal, you're not partisan. Yeah. Um, and yet, um, I don't see any impact that they would have on the presidential race other than to help Donald Trump. What do you think? Yeah, well, we're not tribal at the bulwark, but um, we are rational. Uh, and can look at the reality, all right? Yeah. And so, you do I, the sure, math. I would love. Yeah, I mean, Bill Crystal. Nobody who 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 loves a, a unity ticket more than Bill Crystal. No one in America, you know. I mean, hell, if we could get a unity presidency of Joe uh, Joe Manchin and Liz Cheney, if I could snap my fingers, great, I'm for it. All right, but like, come on, it's not going to happen. And and that that transcript um, that are, uh, that I think Puck published. Yeah. Um, Puck, yeah. Uh, was uh, was really telling that, that this is Nancy Jacobson and Mark Penn are egomaniacal. That they are they're uh, uh, you know they want their they're grifting money from a bunch of uh, you know boomer millionaires uh, that like want to live in a world that doesn't exist. They live on the Upper East Side and like uh, they, they think that you know they can wish this into existence. The people don't want this. I did I guess it was maybe two weeks ago. I did my not my party on this. That 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 yeah. It might seem illogical, but but the fact that Trump is so dangerous 
it makes it less likely that people would support a third party. Right, like I, the third parties right. that have even no none have come close to working. But the one that came the closest yeah. to working was per, per, Perot when Clinton and and H W were seen as pretty close, right? Because it was when Clinton right. was really leaning into the DLC thing, and Bush mm -hmm. was seen as the moderate Republican. Perot's like, oh, here's a third option, and people feel comfortable, like, eh, I like Bush a little better than Clinton, but it, would Clinton be that bad? I can yeah, try it with Perot or inverse, yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah, it wasn't existential. This is. People are not going to do it. So the only people who are going to do it is you're going to trick some low information people, one or two percent that could matter, right. that could matter on the margins. So, no, yeah. it's, it's a, well, it's a the, horrific the idea. They yeah. are idiots and egomaniacal. I do not think that this is a there are some people in the Never Trump world who think that this is like a secret MAGA attempt to steal the election yeah. for Donald no. Trump. I don't really think that. I think that this is Occam's razor. They're idiots and egomaniacs. And, and God willing, they can't recruit anybody to do it. So um, let's talk about something um, uh, interview you had recently. Um, you talked to uh, Texas Congressman uh, Colin Allred um, on, on, on the other podcast a little while ago. And then sure enough, he is now jumping into the U.S. Senate race in Texas against Ted Cruz. He's an interesting guy. Um, and, and I know you've talked about him, but let me just play a little bit of his his announcement video, because I thought it was interesting the way he. He raised certain issues and took it right to Ted Cruz. Let's play this. When I left the NFL, I thought my days of putting people on the ground were over. Then, January 6th happened. I remember hearing the glass breaking and the shouts coming closer. I texted my wife, whatever happens, I love you. Then I took off my jacket and got ready to take on anyone who came through that door. And Ted Cruz, he cheered on the mob. We will not go quietly into the night. Then hid in a supply closet when they stormed the Capitol. But that's Ted for you. <laughs> oh, I love All that hat, detail. no that's cattle. For you. When Texans were freezing in the dark, he jetted off to Cancun. He'll do anything to get on Fox News, but can't be bothered to help keep rural Texas hospitals open. Spends months trying to whip up phony culture wars, but not a minute trying to raise wages or lower drug prices. Yeah. Okay, Tim, do you, first of all, I got to ask you this. It's good. You, you didn't write that for him, did you? Because it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, I'm not. I'm. I'm retired. Um, I uh, we, we. I do. I do DM with him from time to time, and um, I think he's going to be strong. Uh, you know, well, Texas is still tough. The ad is really good. If I had written it for him, I would have. I. I. I've been telling him. I just keep leaning in harder on the cop stuff. You know, uh, yeah. uh, this this I'm I'm on the side of the police. I'm on the side of our law enforcement and law and order. Ted Cruz is responsible for the deaths of cops. OK, that's who this guy is. I think that that's good. He he has a, already has a good ear for it. George Bush and Laura are his constituents, actually, in Dallas. Mm -hmm. like, that's where he lives in the Dallas suburbs where George and Laura live. So uh, the interview with him. Um, he had strep when he did it. People should go watch it if they haven't on the on the next level. It was a couple of weeks ago. It's just kind of scroll mm -hmm. down to the next level feed. Um on YouTube or the Apple podcast. And, um, and uh, you know, he, he is the, he has not, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's careful, uh, but he's impressive. And I think that he's going for a Biden model, right? Like he's not the Beto, he's not, you know, hair on fire. Right. Um, and I think that he's, he's trying to position himself vis-a-vis -vis Trump as I'm competent, you know, I'm center left, uh, you know, that th this other guy is like a fucking podcaster and, yeah. and a, you know, and like a, and like a Pretty tweeter yeah. and not a center. Nothing wrong with okay. being a podcaster, by the way. So, I mean, that, that was my next question is, is how is he not, um, there's you know, some things wrong with uh, it, you know, but Beto, um, you know, Beto surprised everybody by coming as close as he did um, against Ted Cruz. He only lost by three points. And then, of course, I think he kind of flamed out. Uh, so why do we think that Colin Allred will do better than Beto O'Rourke? Or do we? Yeah. So I do. We, I we mean, do. I, I definitely think he'll do better than Beto did in the governor's race. Um, and I was very negative on the Beto governor's race. Yeah. And I like Beto. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. I just, uh, you know, the he just got too far out over his skis and was positioned as too liberal. And and and, and what you, you got to here's the thing. It you is have Texas. to win people that voted for Donald Trump. Yeah, right. it's Texas. You have to win people that voted for Donald Trump. Okay, Donald Trump won the state by five points. So Beto, you know, just got too far out on his flank. I think that what Beto did that was useful was was engage the engagement, the turnout way up. 
right? But now you got those people in the system. They're registered, younger voters, et cetera. Now you got to win crossover voters. You know, you got to get the people that Beto engaged into the system, you know, which got the floor higher in Texas and yeah. you have to win some crossover voters. Can Allred do that? I don't know. Here, here's what I do know. Beto, Ted Cruz ran significantly below uh, uh, Abbott in 18, okay? If, if, if Allred can do that again, if he can get people who just don't like Ted Cruz because he's not likable to cross over and split ticket and vote for him, it, I, I think it's a winnable. I compare it kind of the, to the Frisch race against Boebert. He got mm. really close. It's a tough. Yeah. It's a tough race, but but it's a vulnerable opponent. And if you run a good campaign, I, I think that I, I think that it's a it's a stretch goal. But this is this isn't like Jamie Harrison in South Carolina and Amy McGrath in Kentucky and some of these buzzy races that we've seen in the past from Democrats that are total flameouts. I, I think that he, uh, he has a legitimate shot right. if, if he runs a good race. Well, and and and, and Ted Cruz, of course, is uniquely unlikable. Um, you know, you you think about the. Yes. You know, the political figures, you know, m- many Cruz. of them have people who say, I really like this guy. The thing about Ted Cruz, and of course, I realized this back in 2016, when some of us thought we, we will use Cruz to stop Donald Trump, which was a terrible idea, right. because it turns out that Ted Cruz was so universally low. The only option we had. That, he, that was the only option, but he was universally low. OK, I, I, I have one more uh, thing that I wanted to, uh, to, to share with you, because this is particularly painful for me uh, as, as part of our um, okay. our our extended years long apology tour. Uh, we don't have to spend a lot oh, of time. Oh, you're putting the hair shirt this. on? Well, I love it when you put the hair shirt on. Okay, so the, there's a story about, <laughs> this is what the back end is. Since we're going to New York, there's a story about what happened in the New York subway where you had a homeless guy who was yelling and screaming. He would, did not hit anyone, did not attack anyone. And you had this uh, off duty or former Marine, um, he hasn't been arrested. Um, guy uh, t- tackles him, brings him to the floor and chokes the life out of him um, on the subway, kills the guy. Um, yeah, obviously a major flashpoint because it's caught on camera. This homeless man clearly having mental issues who is killed by a vigilante on the subway. Um, because this is New York, because this is 2023, people are dividing along political tribal lines. There are people who are applauding it, who think that it's great that this guy was, you know, defending, um, you know, law and order, et cetera, versus people say, you just killed this man for doing, you know, for yelling on the subway. So this came up on, is this Fox and Friends? Oh, they all blur together. Yeah. So th- this comes up on Fox, Fox and Friends. And here's Wisconsin's own Rachel Campos Duffy sharing her deep thoughts about why this has become controversial. I'm excited. Play. Yeah. Um, this is all meant to distract people. Um, we saw that during the last big racial riots uh, with George Floyd, a lot of power was consolidated in the Democrat Party. A lot of election rules were changed during that period of time with COVID and everything else going on. These are opportunities to consolidate power and to distract minorities um, with fake racial stuff so they don't think about what's happening to their economy, to their paychecks, to their grocery bills, to everything else that's happening in America. And again, oh, God, the stupidity. Uh, well, I mean, it's just the it's she all used to there. Publish her. Was she? Uh, hmm? you, did she get you guys? Was she the Tim before Tim? Was she the Friday? Seg, Friday was Fridays with Charlie and Rachel Campos. No, Duffy? it was that. It was actually worse than that. Um, I. <laughs> I, I created a thing called the Right Women Awards for the most prominent, um, bright, best and brightest, uh, you know, conservative women in Wisconsin. And she was brightest. one of the award winners. Well, see, that's what hurts mm. so much because it's so stupid. <laughs> it's like it, it's the conspiracy theory. Like okay, people are not genuinely shocked to see a man choked to death in the subway. There's the strings are being pulled by who? There's sort of this idea that George Soros is sitting there saying, what is the plan? Let's. You know, let's whip up black people about this thing so they won't think about the price of eggs or something. I mean, it's like so honestly, we can take power and and, and power you is know, being taken. Mean, get, get millions of people listening to Fox News going, yes, that that's right. We can't actually be concerned that this is a horrible human tragedy here. We have to see it in the context of, you know, we're not talking about what we want to talk about. I mean, every moment we talk about the death of an innocent black man is a minute that we're not able to talk about 
um, Hunter Biden's porn or something. I mean, you know, things that yeah. really matter to America. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> I mean, this is how like brain wormed these people are, right? And that's oh, sad, that was the I, word I like, had. This yeah, is just a sad wormed. story. Yeah, it's just a yeah, sad story. A I, like, this is horrible. And like, we'll see how, how uh, what the, you know, as more details emerge. I will say one other fact, we're doing this on jobs day. Yeah. And um, the lowest black unemployment rate and and like a half century right now. So, you know, I, I kind of can't, like this, this, yeah, this becomes just, that just shows you like the, the buzzwords are, are completely like disconnected from any news, right? It's like, it's like, why aren't they, why aren't they talking about the economy and how bad the economy is for black people? It's like, is it bad for black people? I mean, I, yeah, sure. A price of some prices are, you know, we, we're still dealing with inflation and, and stuff, but like on balance, um, you know, there's a lot of positive stuff to talk about, but they, they, there's not like an effort to care about that, right? Like it yeah, is, it right. is, it's COVID, it's George Soros. Oh, it's- okay. No, um, I, I need, I need to double back because we were talking about what an amazing, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours we've had in the judicial system. And we we're talking about the, the yeah. I, I got distracted by the, the, the proud boys, but, but what happened in that Manhattan courtroom in the E. Jean Carroll case was really amazing. That it's a civil case, so you can bring in all kinds of things. I mean, she had very compelling testimony, but playing the video for the jury of the Donald Trump deposition, this was just an epic moment where he's actually asked about the Access Hollywood tape about, so do you think celebrities can really grab women by the pussies? And he basically goes, yeah, you know, for millions of years for, you know, what did he say? You know, yeah, uh, famous people get away with stuff, fortunately or unfortunately. Maybe I reversed it. Unfortunately or fortunately, they get away with it. And then he's asked, well, are you a star? And he goes, yeah. So, I, <laughs> okay, this is this is going well. And then, of course, the jury also gets to see Donald Trump, the man in full, where um, he's talking about how, well, you know, he couldn't have raped uh, E. Jean Carroll because, you know, uh, she's not his type, even though apparently she looked just like Marla Maples, but leaving that aside. And then he turns to the lawyer who's questioning him and said, and by the way, you're not my type either. I would have no interest in you either. It's like, OK, so this is going to be the last impression that the jurors have of Donald Trump, the man basically saying, yeah. I'm a star, and yeah, stars have been able to get away with grabbing women by the pussy for centuries, unfortunately or fortunately. I don't think this trial went well for him. I don't. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to say that it's going to move the needle or this is going to be the thing that's going to change. But you, you know, give me your thoughts on all of this because it's almost in the background. We have all this. We have the sedition. We have the obstruction of justice, and then we have the fact the former president of the United States is credibly being accused of rape and it may not be the top five story of the day um i I thought you had a great newsletter on that point it's just like nobody talks about this i i I would used to call white house briefing room reporters when he was in there um Mm -hmm. friends and just be like why doesn't anyone ever ask him about all of the people that he sexually assaulted or why does anybody ever ask kaylee or or Sarah Huckabee right. Sanders about this? Like, it was like, oh, once he got elected, uh, it's like, well, that, since he got elected, I guess that yeah. means he's in. We litigated all that. that. So God bless. Yeah. yeah, God bless E. Jean Carroll for for bring, taking it to him in civil court. And um, that's uh, the lawyer that you're talking about is my friend, actually, Roberta Kaplan. Uh, oh, yeah. She's amazing. Uh, she handled she it happens well. to be a lesbian, so I don't think it's hurting her feelings that much that uh, that she's not yeah. his type, because uh, uh, he's certainly not her type either. And um, I think that uh, that that lash out is a reflection of of just how effective she's been as a lawyer. Who knows what a jury does in these sort of situations? Yeah. You get one fucking right. MAGA person on the jury, right? right? Like we'll see how it how it shakes out. But good good on E. Jean Carroll and 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 Robbie Kaplan for taking it to him, um, because there are a lot of other women out there who are, who are victims well, of them too. Well, I mean, this is the point that I was making. I'll make I'll make again. I, you know, I, I can't imagine anybody else who has more than two dozen um, accusations of sexual assault being able to survive in business, in sports, in entertainment, um, in any other realm of life. Um, and also, how? when's the last time that Donald Trump was even asked about this? Is it even going to come up at the CNN town hall? How many women's, uh, how many of these women's names will even be mentioned? So, you know, Harvey Weinstein's got to be sitting there and is he in jail somewhere? I hope so. He's like, Wait, OK, this guy might be elected president of the United States and I'm doing how many years for doing this stuff? 
Nobody else. And this is this weird moment we're in where our moral ethical standards for the presidency of the United States are lower than for being a Hollywood mogul, for being a used car salesman, for being yeah, you know, go a, lower. A, a CEO. I mean, literally, Donald Trump could not be would not be named the CEO of any private publicly held company, right? There's, there's nobody would even put him on the board. They wouldn't allow him to own a team in the NFL or the NBA. Um, he couldn't pass a security check at any level Be of the teacher. federal government. <laughs> Think about what you, you know, would, a, would, would your local Burger King hire him as a manager? Yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah, we're worried about yet, our teachers being groomers. Yeah, he see, I be know. A fucking teacher. I, okay. So because I live in Wisconsin, I, I live amidst a, a constant focus group of real people. And so I do know people who are, you know, have voted for Donald Trump. And there's this weird disconnect where, OK, they're willing to go along with him. But in their own lives, they have a sense of decency and character and rectitude. Yes. They would not hire yes. a lawyer or an accountant or a principal who had Donald Trump's characters character they they want their children to be around role models except and then there's this break except yes let's give donald trump back control of the nuclear codes let's put him in charge of the irs the cia the the fbi let's make him the face of america and it's like in every other aspect of their lives they would have nothing to do with someone like donald trump except when it comes to making donald trump president of the fucking united states what can well, I say, we could do a full fucking hour on that. We could do a whole hour. We could do a whole nother well, I wrote hour. A whole, I wrote a whole piece for the Atlantic <laughs> on it, and and it basically um, t- took a perhaps unfair shot at uh, Alexander Hamilton for being naive about this. Tim Miller, thank you for joining me. We will do this again next week. And if you want to see Tim and I live in New York, that is May eighteenth. You can go online and get the tickets today. Will there be a name that tune section of the live event? We're close to Broadway. Have you considered to you contemplated be, that yet? To be determined. Thank you all for listening <laughs> okay. to this weekend's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back on Monday. We'll do this all over again. Yeah.